often hear, you know, that, that the oceans cover 71% of our planet, which is very impressive. But I think what's equally impressive is how deep that ocean is. Our, our blue marble is not just an ocean planet. It's a deep ocean planet to our sort of human perspective. So average ocean depth is about 3,800 meters and more than 60% of our planet is, is covered by water that's more than one kilometer deep. And it's only been in, in less than the past century that we've had the technology to explore this environment. So that remoteness is the main challenge in my work. Most recently, we've been working in the Southern Ocean uh, near Antarctica, and we've seen the first high temperature deep sea vents there. All new species, more than a couple of dozen new species there. So uh, an entirely different, what we call province of life. It's, it's like going to a, to a new continent for the first time. And at the same time, we've been working in the Cayman Trough uh, in the Caribbean Sea, uh, some very deep vents there. And again, quite a few new species, uh, and the same in the Indian Ocean as well. Uh, and so finally, after about 40 years of scientists studying these environments, we're in a position to appreciate that deep sea vents are not the same all around the world. And that's vitally important because we're now starting to see vents being targeted potentially for the mining of the mineral resources, uh, and we must understand what controls their patterns of life. So far, uh, we've been involved in describing new species across five different phyla uh, of animals. So uh, mollusks, we've got new species of gastropods, snails uh, that we've described, new species of crustaceans, shrimp and, and crabs, uh, but also the echinoderms, the spiny skinned animals, a whole new family uh, of sea stars, the starfish, including the first known species that thrives at deep sea vents. Uh, and most recently, I'm actually working on a new species of fish uh, as well from the deep sea vents. Our work is very much like the sort of 19th century naturalists exploring islands above the waves. In fact, that's, a, that's an analogy I often like to use because these deep sea vents, they are island-like colonies uh, of marine life on the ocean floor. And so, we can see the, the patterns of marine life most clearly by using them as a sort of model system to, to see how species disperse and evolve. Uh, so that's a, that's a really strong analogy, I think. In terms of how I got interested in this work, it was really by accident. I was a zoology undergraduate student and I was wandering through the university library and I saw a book uh, with a picture on the cover of this odd red plumed worm-like animal uh, and I thought I, I'm a zoology student but I'm having a hard time you know telling what type of animal that really is so I fetched the book down started flicking through it and it was a, a, a compilation of recent research papers uh, about some of the early discoveries at deep sea vents. I was absolutely captivated by this subject, uh, took every opportunity to find out more about it and decided that was what I wanted to do. day is really typical, uh, I think, for, for any scientist, but in, but in my field, it really depends on, on what phase of a research project we're in. So uh, in what I would call a good year, uh, I've spent five months of the year living and working at sea. Uh, so I'm on a ship for a month or two month expeditions at a time. So that's a very intense experience. Uh, but then, OK, we, we also are analysing what we've collected, what we found back in the lab, and that's perhaps a little bit more, more traditional. Uh, and then, of course, an awful lot of the life of a modern scientist is spent writing, not just writing up our results to share them with everyone else, uh, but also writing the proposals to keep this work going. Well, when I'm ashore, uh, I like to take, make the most of, of the countryside, because uh, I actually really miss the trees and, and so on when I'm away at sea. Uh, so I like to go out cross-country running. Uh, and I run through a forest near where I live. Uh, and the thing that I find is, is when we go to the deep ocean, we, we expect the weird and wonderful. You know, things like uh, the anglerfish with the parasitic dwarf males or bone-eating zombie worms. You know, we, we kind of expect the weird stuff down at the bottom of the ocean. But you know, when you come back and you're running through the everyday world and looking at what's around you, it suddenly strikes you how bizarre the commonplace and everyday can be. 
you know, the adaptations that we see in plants to produce sort of, you know, spiky seed pods, just so they can get carried from one place to another by animals. If we encountered that in the deep ocean, we'd think that was weird and wonderful. When it is weird and wonderful, but it's here with us. So in a sense, going to these extreme places gives us perhaps a, a different perspective of the world when we come back. <laughs>